and welcome to another episode of BOF Live. Uh, we have been doing these conversations now since way back at the beginning of the lockdowns and uh, the pandemic. And each week we've been chatting with people in our community who have important messages, ideas, and insights to share. And this week I am really pleased to welcome my old friend Tremaine Emery uh, to BOF Live. Uh, welcome, Tremaine. Hi, Imran. How are you, man? Thank you Hi. for having me. Thank you for thank you for being with us. Um, there's a lot you for us. And real quick, when you say old friend, you're not being you're being real because do you remember me and A side? We did the first BOF party at La Bodega Negra. You and Tom Ford, and that's like the first time me and you. We might have met before that, but you remember that? That was like seven years ago. Yeah, I actually was, I was telling someone that story earlier today, um, going back to La Bodega Negra. And I was yeah. actually, that was, that was when I, we had a little party to celebrate our first seed funding round and all of our friends and supporters came and you were kind enough to host us that night. So that was, that was a big day for us. Yeah, funny man, time, time. But yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, I, you know, there's a lot to discuss today, and um, I don't. I definitely want to talk about the election in the U.S. and yeah. you know, some of these partnerships that you've been working on um, via your alter ego, uh, Denim Tears. But before uh, yeah. we did, before we did that, you know, I thought it was, you know, a good opportunity to to kind of explain who Tremaine Emery is. You're such a multifaceted guy, a polymath uh, with so many interests and um, talents and, you know, different projects and the things that you get involved with. So like, you know, at the beginning, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you became Tremaine Emery. Like, you know, what's your story? You know, where did you grow up? How did you first get integrated and involved in the fashion space? Um, I, I was born in, um, Atlanta, Georgia, 1981. And, um, soon after, three months after my parents, my dad got a job at CBS news. Um, he worked for a local, a local affiliate in Atlanta. And before that he was in Denver. And then before that he was in the army as a, a photo, um, motion picture cameraman. And then he came out and through all kinds of chances of luck and hard work, he got a job as a TV news cameraman in um, uh, New York City. So when we were three months old, we moved to Queens. Um, and that's how I grew up in New York. You know, my parents are from a very small town called Harlem, Georgia. Um, and they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're radicals. They're like, for where they come from, Harlem, Georgia is amazing people. It's a one red light town. When my parents grew up there, there was 1,500 people. But something in my parents got them to keep moving out and going further. And, um, you know, that's my first introduction to art um, and creativity is through my parents. Um, you know, from their style to shopping vintage. Um, we didn't even call it shopping vintage. It was antique shopping or like, my mom said, we're going antique shopping. So, you know, my mom being like, oh, these are good Levi's to get or this Lacoste shirt or, you know, yeah. So that's my first experience with clothing was vintage. And then my first experience with design was my parents owned a, um, a video store, you know, VHS tape store in the 80s in Elmhurst, Queens. And um, my mom, she ran it mainly because my dad was working five days a week and then he'd be there on the weekends or at, and at night. And um, there's a rap group called Kid and Play. Of course. And they're, yeah, and Play, yeah, Play, the dark skinned one, he worked at the store and he designed, he was into fashion before music. He designed the t shirts, our t shirts, because it was, um, our video store was called Just, Just Us Videos. And um, he designed the t shirt. And I remember like seeing that as a kid and, He's the first, he's, that's the first, my introduction to design was like play from kid and play. And like my, cause my parents had the merch and people would buy it. Even after the, um, we lost the lease and the store closed down, 
we'd see people, my, remember my brother tell me he'd be going to um, junior high school. In high school, he'd be on the bus and he'd see people wearing a shirt years after the store closed down. So that was kind of my first introduction and like the way the parents, my parents ran the store and merchandised it and dealt with people. That was my first intro to marketing, design, customer service, all in one. And, um, and entre being an entrepreneur, you know, um, and then from there, just, you know, we, we lived in Flushing and then when I was like nine years old, we moved to Jamaica, Queens, St. Albans. And so, you know, on the weekends, we might be at the MoMA, we might go to a great, I remember one thing that stands out, we went, my mom was like, we're going to see an opera today. And she took, a, took me to go see Pavarotti at the Great Lawn at Central Park. And the Harlem Boys Choir was singing, singing, um, singing with him. I remember, you know, they, they did the free concert at the Great Lawn. And like me, my mom, my dad, my brothers went. And we always, the weekends were always an adventure. Um, my mom was always in the newspaper. Um, and we'd be going to different things. Um, yeah, so that's my first, that's my into creativity art was through my parents. Yeah. Got it. Um, Georgia has been in the news the past week or so. Um, oh, yeah. A lot. Uh, I think the election results there are being, you know, recounted. And there's two Senate seats that remain unfilled because they're going to be some runoff elections early in January. I mean, it's been such an incredible week of drama, political intrigue and, um, you know, success for uh, Biden and Harris in their run for um, president and vice president. I mean, I've been seeing all of those images coming out of Brooklyn and New York and LA and all, you know, what's, been, what's it been like for you the past week or so? What are your relatives and friends in Georgia saying? I mean, what's your overall take on what's happened um, with the, the, the election results? Um, as they, they kind of finally confirmed a Biden-Harris victory on Saturday? Um, wow, it's, you know, it's serendipitous you ask that because you won't, I mean, you will believe it's the truth, but my, my nana, my nana, she, uh, my grandmother, my mother's, my mother's mother, she, um, she watched, she'd been in home hospice care right, with, um, you know, bad heart and, um, for the last two months. She's 93, was 93. She watched Biden's speech. She watched Biden's speech and then went to sleep, passed away. Oh. I don't even know, yeah, I don't even know, you know, rest in peace to Nana. She's an amazing human being. Um, was able to share, share her with the world through my little documentary I did with Levi's. Um, in January, but part of me just feels like she saw that, that that guy's out of here, and she's like, "All right, I can go." I could be wrong, but she literally, she watched that speech. My aunt Connie called me, told me your Nana watched that speech. She went and sat in her favorite chair and passed away. Uh, you know, I think, you know, it is an amazing. It's a monumentous moment because, you know, people like Stacey Abrams and all the micro and macros of people organizing outside of just like the normal, um, the normal rigmarole of uh, election. And, you know, she's, Stacey Abrams signed up 800,000 people in Georgia with her and her, her team. That's it's unreal, unreal. And, um, you know, there's more to do. And I think we're going to get those Senate seats too. You know, I'm going to, I'm getting involved on uh, my friend Angelo from Awake. He called me yesterday and we're going to work with um, a gentleman who owns a store called Social Status down in Atlanta. And we're going to work to get people to vote and get Democrats in those seats. So, um, but it's not about us. It's like, it's been an incredible week, you know, and, there's a lot more work to do. 
And um, hopefully, my main hope with this week is, aside from the celebrations, we can keep up the, 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 the fever and the energy and not get tired and live this way for the rest of our lives, being involved in the political process. So I'm more looking forward and seeing what I can do to help stimulate that than, you know, I mean, seeing like, like you said, the celebrations in New York and, you know, all over the country, it's amazing to see. And now we just got to keep the pressure on, on the elected officials, Biden and, and um, Camilla and, and the people that come after them to actually serve the people and, um, you know, make it safe place for people of color, women, LGBTs, uh, you know, everyone. Um, and that's really the, and the environment. Those are the two most important things, you know, take care of the people who have been subjugated by, uh, you know, systematic patriarchy and racism and all that stuff. And then um, the environment. So that's what it has to be out, be about from now on. So I hope this is a start, you know? Yeah. Have, have you always been politically active and kind of motivated to get involved in the electoral process? Or has this come more recently from a kind of growing frustration with the systemic issues you were just referring to? Um, I would say I've been aware, I've always voted. But as far as getting involved, it comes from um, my dear friend um, and artist, He's a designer as well, um, Brendan Fowler. Um, you know, he has a brand called um, Election Reform. And he's really the person that really educated me on. Not, I understood the flaws of the electoral college and the, you know, the voting system, but about using, um, using our art and clothing to stimulate the kids and stimulate people you know he's the he's the one that showed me and like he's my mentor in that when it comes to that and um he's the first person i've done like a voting drive with and voting t-shirts with so it's really brendan fowler because he's been doing this for a long time um trying his best to educate people about the um ele you know electoral reform and ele electoral college and, and voting so it really comes from like brendan you know brendan and then he's doing that inspired me to get involved in the way I've been for the last, I guess, three or four years. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, you know, as I was kind of doing my homework last night, it, I thought it was really interesting how you've woven in this activism, you know, this, mm -hmm. you know, this get out the vote, um, you know, goal in some of your recent partnerships. And so I, I wanted to start with the, the Converse partnership, because obviously that, that was one that was announced way earlier this year, I think even before the pandemic. And mm -hmm. then it got a bit hairy with, with Nike and, and you know, the um, executives there as you started you know, really holding them to account. Can you talk to us about you know, why you did that partnership in the first place? And then yeah. you know, what happened and how you managed to kind of you know, in those very intense conversations with the CEO of Converse, you know, really mm -hmm. move, move both Converse and Nike as a wider organization along this learning curve around the work yeah. that they need to do uh, in addressing um, systemic racism. Yeah, no problem. Um, the partnership originally happened through a guy by the name of um, Daryl Johnson. His nickname's Curtains, and um, he was working for Congress for some odd years on um, apparel, but then he dipped his toes into the collaborative stuff. And he reached out to me to do a shoe about two, almost two years ago, year and a half ago. And he wanted to do a thing where it was like me, Chris Gibbs, and um, Shaniqua Jarvis, both amazing people. Um, and I said yes, and then Dates kept getting moved around. And then I was like, well, I want to do the Pan-African flag. I want to take the Stars and Stripes and do it with the Pan-African flag. Chuck. He's like, cool, let's see if we get it approved. You know, it's based on Marcus Darby, David Hammond, the Liberty Rock. And then it gets approved. And then it was on pace to come out in February. And 
it was going to have a, a civic side to it as well as far as a voter. It was not going to be a voter drive. It was going to be about a passport drive, um, getting people, specifically people of color, passports. You know, I, I didn't have a passport until I was 26, 27. My mom died at age 58 without ever traveling or leaving, having a passport. And that's the fate of many people of color. They never leave America um, for a lot of reasons. But then, um, you know, the events occurred with uh, Ahmad and Brianna and um, George. And these events were not actually events that don't happen a lot, unfortunately. But due to, you know, COVID and everyone sitting at home, particularly privileged people, you know, in my opinion, privileged, privileged white people um, were like, oh, wow, this is what black people are going through. Because this had been happening. You know, I've done podcasts five years ago about a guy who got choked out by police in Staten Island over selling loose cigarettes. And that was on camera too. That wasn't a big, Eric Gardner got choked to death on camera. George Floyd choked to death on camera. What's the, why wasn't there protest five years ago? So for me, I was like, this is par course. So I see the outrage. I see, you know, 15 million people come out. I'm like, cool. And then I see the donations, the pledges from brands. So when I saw Converse's pledge and, and Nike's pledge and, and Jordan's pledge, I was just like, I'm trying to, I was, in June, I was still 38. I'm like, I'm turning 39 years old. I've seen this cycle a couple of times in my lifetime. I've seen the money get donated, yet I don't see black people not dying by the hands of police. And, you know, which trickles, which is, trickles down for systemic institutional racism. So I was just like, man, I'm putting off this, these shoes that's the Pan-African flag and what it represents as far as Marcus Davi, what it represents as far as David Hammonds, what it represents as far as black people. My neighborhood, the Liberty Rock, I said, I can't, I can't, me personally, I can't have my thing and come out and what my partners did was donate money because money's a band-aid. You know, if you have a, if you have someone that gener has generational, you know, you have people in your family, which I do have, with like the generational poverty, giving them $20,000 isn't gonna help them. What's gonna help them is figure out why does this cycle keep happening? The bills not being paid, not being out of work, and you're one, you know, root canal away from living in your car. That's 20,000, giving someone money isn't gonna fix it. You have to get in there and really fix the systemic things, what's going on in the schools in the neighborhoods, the hospitals, what's going on with the transportation, all that stuff. And so that was my whole thing was, we all gotta get our hands dirty, including me. You know, that Instagram post was also putting pressure on myself to do more than just donate money, you know? Cause again, you, we go back can to- you explain that, Can you explain the Instagram post? Cause maybe some people listening, you know, did, did you know, what was in the Instagram post? Oh, so I just, Posted the sneakers, you know, pictures of the cads of the sneakers and a sample of the sneakers and basically said, you know, I can't put these sneakers out if all we're doing, the company that I'm working with is doing is donating money. You know, I need to know specifically what are they doing to combat police brutality in black neighborhoods um, and fight systemic racism. And I use the example of like, because what happens is it's like the brands that come in and like, let's say they put in some money to a basketball tournament and then whoever's really good, maybe they'll get a sponsorship or they'll put some money into a school and whoever's really smart, they'll help them get out where I need a kid that's dyslexic and has a, doesn't have parents to get help. And he's, his grades suck and he's the worst kid in class and he's always getting the fights. That's who we got to help. The kid who sucks at basketball but he wants to play, but also he wants to do more. We got to help that kid, not just the the bronze and the and the and, and and the brainiacs and the you know. So that's my thing. Was sometimes it's like, where is this money going? What is it going to help? You know, who are we protecting with this money? So 
that's what I was just tasking them with and myself. And the best way that at the time that myself and Congress saw we could um, help was move up the sneakers, come out before um, the election and direct all the money for the marketing to educating and urging people to vote in the swing states. Because, um, you know, as you can see, uh, I think it's, pro example, Proposition 17 in LA, 17 or 16, sorry if I'm wrong guys, was about people who, felons coming home from jail, having the right to vote. Now in California, if you go to jail, you can vote when you serve your time and pay your debt to society, which they couldn't before. So that's true. That's just example of like voting works, you know, Ta like tactile, micro for macro voting works, no matter how corrupt or racist the system is, voting does work because they wouldn't do gerrymandering. They wouldn't try to rig elections, you know, so on and so forth. So that's what we, you know, and that was the best I could do. And I just, for me, the sneaker had to mean something to what was going on now, which could to directly help prevent what's been going on with people in America, you know, and not just police brutality, everything, healthcare. So, and it's for me, it starts with voting and it starts with education. So um, I was super pleased that, you know, there was no pushback from Congress and they were all open arms and ears to figure out how to make this sneaker as a um, motivational tool to, to get people to vote. And I, you know, I think we did that. I think, you know, we played a small part in um, getting people up to, to register to vote and getting people to go out and vote and really vote for the community and educate themselves on all the candidates, all the propositions and make it the best choice for the community um, and for your fellow, not to sound corny, fellow American. <laughs> Well, we've seen that all of those little efforts really added up, right? And the margins in some of these elections have been so oh, minuscule. It, it could really have gone either way. And I, I, that's why I find all of these grassroots movements around working both at a policy level to address, you know, voter suppression, but also working at a grassroots level to like get literally get out the vote it really it really worked it you know for people who are you know hoping the democrats uh would win the election you know i think you know we can credit you know you you mentioned stacy abrams and you know there's so many get out the vote um yeah things that have happened black, black, black vote black vote black voters matter yeah um shout out to them that's who i'm donating the money from the sales of the speakers from um my my first drop on my website uh, very amazing organization. Uh, yeah, you're right, man. Just the margins, like some of these states, it's like 10,000 vote difference. Yeah. Well, but we should talk about the shoes. And, you know, you mentioned David Hammond earlier. Um, and I, I was looking at some of his art last night and it's, you know, really, you know, striking. You know, can you talk to us a little bit about why his art and, you know, was such an inspiration to you in terms of, developing um, mm. the Converse sneakers? Yeah. Um, you know, you have, guy, you have guides in this life that you know and that you don't know. So David's artwork um, and some of the ways he's chosen to live his life has been a guide for me. And um, he's someone I learned about probably on a decade ago, maybe seven years ago through, through um, conversations with a side and Virgil. I knew his artwork, but I didn't really know about his, how he, yeah, his mo his modus operandi, as they said. So um, I learned about him and a lot of what he does is ironic, right? Like he'll take a racial slur like spade, being called a spade, and then he'll make art of it and play with that and take the power out of it. Um, so he does that, but then also he puts power into things. So it's like taking the American flag, which necessarily, you know, indigenous people, people of color, women might not feel we have much control over or attachment to, and he puts the Pan-African colors on the flag. You know, he did that in 1990. So, um, 
Yeah, he's a big, big inspiration. And, um, you know, it's, um, I'm just grateful that he exists and his art exists and to be inspired by it. Um, and I'm happy to be, I feel like, you know, not feel like I know for a fact, many kids have hit me up on DM and come up to me like, you know, I never knew who David Hammonds was. I bought the book, Blizzard Ball Shell. So I'm happy to be a bridge. And that's probably my favorite part of my practice is being a bridge of um, knowledge between generations because um, just because you make something doesn't mean um, it's like a tree in a forest, right? A tree in a forest falls, doesn't, no one's there to hear it. So if someone makes amazing art or poetry or books and there's the next generation doesn't even know it exists because it's not in their algorithm, right? The algorithm does not bring up David Hammond or Kara Walker or James Baldwin. How do how did these, how did these spirits, how did their ancestors get to them? And it's through bridges, you know, like a bridge over water. So I, I, I see myself as a bridge over the algorithm. Algorithms, the water dividing, you know, the youth from the knowledge maybe they could, could, I won't, you know, it's not for everyone. So maybe someone might be like, I don't like his artwork and that's fine. But yeah, I see myself as a bridge over the algorithm to people who maybe are looking for more because I'm looking for more. And, you know, many people have been a bridge over the algorithm for me, like, you know, A-side, um, you know, so many people in my life, my parents, um, you know, Serge Becker, uh, you know, Adara, um, so many art teachers and people that have put me on things, you know, Lulu, so many people that I've known, Arthur Jaffa, The Ashley Gates, so many friends of all levels, whether it's artists, I got friends still working in the stock room that put me on a thing. So we are bridges to knowledge, knowledge for each other. So that's what I just try to do because for whatever reason, the way the dice roll, I have you know, a bit of people pay attention to what I say and do. So I try to get information that I feel is pertinent to me and has helped me to other people. So the best, to me, the highest level I could do that is by putting him in Marcus Garvey's flag and the Liberty Rock. Cause there's three people. It's like the women in my neighborhood that painted the Liberty Rock, Marcus Garvey and David Hammonds and put in what they created on to something that's like a super billboard, right? It's the most, one of the most famous sneaker sil silhouettes is like Converse, Jordan one, Air Force one, right? Aliens came to earth, you want to show them a sneaker, you show them probably those three sneakers. Then, um, yeah, to put that imagery on there, the best kind of bridge I could I could do, so, yeah. Is, is that why, you know, all of these big companies um, are drawn to you, Tremaine? Is that you're, you're this bridge? You know, I, I, was, I was reading about your partnership with Levi's as well, which is like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> not just a sneaker, it's like a two year long kind of really immersive detailed partnership. And maybe talk to us a little bit about Levi's and then also like how you choose which companies to partner with, because you clearly are, you know, you run by a strong moral code, right? And it's, it's, it's really clear in the way that you've been explaining your, you know, your, your, your perspectives and your history, you know, how do you marry your moral code with these big corporate organizations and find the right balance? Um, great question. Um, I, I do it by having, you know, just a line. So obviously when you work with any corporation that has shareholders, that has a board, you know, their main thing is to make money. Don't be confused. You know, their thing is, their number one thing is to make money. So my thing is like, how can I dance with their bottom line with my bottom line? Because my bottom line is like storytelling and, um, and, and getting stories out that normally don't get told. Um, and because that's what the thing I'm obsessed with. I'm obsessed with like left, left things that go popular culture. And so that's why I, I, I deal with these companies because it's like I can take a, a I don't know, 
a left idea talking about the lack of reparations and picking cotton and how that financed and built this country and putting that on denim jeans, on Levi's jeans, and then getting to go popular culture when you see famous people wearing the jeans and this and that. And then whether people are into it or not, they become a billboard for this, my topic, my propaganda. Actually, not even, it's not my propaganda, it's propaganda for black African-Americans, for black people. And, you know, that's why I, I, um, I make the compromise, you know, to, to work with these brands because it's like, I can get these mess, this messaging across a bigger bridge because in the, the day we're still at the point where, you know, Levi's has put in so much work in branding a pair of denim tears jeans, not associated with Levi's does not mean as much to the uninitiated as the denim tears jeans with the Levi's together. And why is that? I can, because people, people, unfortunately, and I'm not taking a shot at anyone because I'm a part of it, but people love validation. That's, that's why, that's how capitalism exists. That's how branding exists is because people seek validation, you know, through things. And, um, and there's no the thing of quality and liking things, but really it's like, oh, if I wear this Hermes belt with the H on it or these Levi's thing or this, you're associating yourself with something that has a positive connotation, which means there's something positive about you. You know, and then you have loads, there's people too who are just like utterly only concerned with style and quality, but that's not the case for everyone. And, um, you know, that validation that you get from buying a brand, buying into something, you know, is what drives consumerism, which drives, you know, that's why celebrity culture was um, the market, you know, the marketing the guys, the guys behind the marketing veil, they created celebrity culture. They made celebrities have to be big because celebrities help push the product. So if you think the celebrity is great and more important than like the bus driver who gets you to school or the teacher or the doctor that saved your life and you had an aneurysm, you think Marilyn Monroe is more special than the teacher in your school. When she wears or she smokes a cool cigarette or a Marlboro, you go and buy it. You know what I mean? Because you've been told by the tabloids and E! News and all the stuff in the front page that these people are great and more special than you. And that these things that they wear will make you closer to them, you know? And cause you know, so that's what, <coughs> that's why <laughs> in my opinion. Okay. Um, you know, you use the word storytelling right now. And, you know, I think it's such a, is such a like apt description of the way you seem to approach your work. Can you tell us the story of Denim Tears um, and what it means? Because, um, yeah. yeah. So huh, like, like, many, like many things, it just started as an inside joke. Um, you know, literally about seven or eight years ago, we were at a dinner for a DJ gig. Me, Caius Pawson of uh, Young Turks fame, uh, Benji B, BBC Radio, uh, Sam Ross from Cold Wall. He was, at that time, he was Virgil's assistant. Um, a side, my partner in crime, one of my best friends. And we we're having dinner before a DJ gig at the Edition Hotel basement in um, London. and they were just cracking jokes on me because I used to do this thing on Instagram where I put up like a, an object or a thing to re represent a selfie. So, so my thing was I was trolling people who put up so, a million selfies of their self on a gram and I just put up all kinds of things and that's what, that's what's represented, you know, that was my selfie, whatever. And then, you know, one time I had put up a picture of the back of my jeans and they were ripped and they looked like a heart, a ripped heart. So a side and Virgil Kais, they're making fun of me about it. And then a sides like, yeah, when Tremaine put up that picture of the, the back of his jeans that looked like a ripped heart. 
And then I think Caius or Asi, one of them said like, like, yeah, the, his denim was crying. And then I said, then I was like, denim tears. Sounds like an R&B band. And everyone's laughing. Boom, the rest of the night goes. So at that time, Virgil had a, he had a, um, a blog with style.com. Yeah. So he'd recap his travels. This is before he off, you know, Louis V, all that. He maybe even off white. And um, he was just like doing a roll call of the dinner. And like everyone else, he called them their real names. And then he goes and did him cheers of Mark Jacobs fame. You know what I mean? I was working at Mark Jacobs uh, as assistant manager at the time on Mount Street. And kind of stuck since then. But then as, the, as happens with like a name happens out of jest, and then you sit and you you um think about it. And I was like, well, denim, a pair of jeans is kind of like life. Like you come in, you, those jeans I had that were ripped, I bought them brand new my first week in London from the Levi's vintage store, 1954 repros, um, 501s, brand new. You come into this life, brand new. My Nana who passed away this week, in 1927, she came, you know, on January 17th, she came into the world brand new. And then she lived 93 years. She saw World War II. She saw, this year she saw COVID. She saw Martin Luther King get killed. She buried five of her kids, buried a grandchild, uh, had a husband, lost a husband, all kinds of things. She had all kinds of great things happen. Grandkids being born, um, you know, saw Obama go in office, blah, blah, blah. The last thing she saw was Camilla Harris. That's attrition. That's like the genes, the genes, attrition. What do we like better, a pair of vintage jeans or we like a brand new pair? What do we like better, a brand new person who hasn't experienced anything or you, the best version of yourself is the person that's gone through life, the bad and the good stuff and through that attrition. So Denim Tears is like, it started off as like a, a, a metaphor for attrition of life, you know? And, um, you know, I could sit here and talk for hours as you could, you know, at the age that we're at, what we've been through, the things that have, um, the good and bad things that have made us who we are. That's the, that's the attrition of life. And then I started creating iconography about two years ago around cotton reefs, cotton. And then it took on a new meaning, you know, when I got approached with, um, by Levi's, and even before that about just creating, start creating all these symbols around cotton and slavery and um, it started to mean more stuff. So that's how I'm, I let ideas, ideas aren't static to me. They grow based on stuff I'm reading, places I'm traveling, people I'm meeting and things that are happening. So if I never moved back to America, Trump's America from London three years ago, December, maybe three years ago, maybe the brands in tears would be totally different if I would have stayed in London, but coming back and really feeling it, like feeling the, I couldn't, I couldn't put the brand out under any other guys other than talking about how did the country get to the point that it's at now. And so then Denim Tears became about the pain of slavery and the, and the reparations and religion iconography and mixed with the cotton iconography to tell a, within a t-shirt, tell the story of how they get us to pick cotton. They gave us religion, okay with the pain. They gave us their version of, you know, religion to be okay with the pain and they stripped us of our tongue and, and what we spoke and our, and our Yoruba religion and stuff like that. And how can I put, you know, there's books and books on this stuff. I have some of them. People way smarter than me have loads of them. How can I condense Flash of Spirit, a James Baldwin book, uh, a Black Panther book? How can I condense it into a T-shirt? And that's what Denim Tears is. It's like condensing these dense things into imagery to make, hopefully, because people, whatever reason, they like how I dress, they like whatever famous person I used to work for or who I know, and they're paying attention to me. And then that's like the hook. And then I can get them to maybe open up a book or have a conversation. You know, maybe someone might be wearing dental tears because they just think I'm cool 
But then someone will ask them, why does that black Jesus t-shirt have a, why does Jesus have a cotton reef on his head instead of a, of a crown of thorns? And then they're like, maybe the person won't know and they got to figure it out. Or maybe the person won't know. It's, you know, oh, this guy Tremaine saying that, you know, that's how they got us to, to pick the cotton and be okay with being in slavery for 400 years by placating us with religion. Mm. That's what he's trying to say. Mm. Oh, why is the Jesus, why is he white features, but like black skin? Because Tremaine's like, he didn't want to create him because Jesus was like, a, you know, a Palestinian Jew. He didn't, he doesn't look black, he didn't look white. He was Middle Eastern, he looked like you. You know what I mean? Kind of looked like you. And um, by making him, I blackwash what was whitewashed. It's a troll. It's a, you know, it's like, I'm not saying Jesus is black, even though a lot of people think I'm saying that. I'm talking about, I'm blackwashing the white gays. Yeah. And neither is right, actually, you know? So anyway, I'm just putting all these layered things in t-shirt and denim form, you know? So it's fun. And it's like, I think it's a more palatable way than, because everyone doesn't have the propensity to sit and read a book. I don't even, like, I have a lot of books and, I got, I still got loads of books to get through. And um, I just find it like, I know kids like images. So I put image, I, I create images that lead them somewhere else. If, if, if they see fit to seek where the image leads them. Mm. You know, I think the the narrative around cotton and slavery is actually really timely right now, because I'm sure you've been seeing the reports of the Uyghur Muslims in Western China, and apparently much of the fashion industry, we don't know exactly whom yet, but everyone's staying quite quiet on it, but it, I was doing a bit of research on it a couple of weeks ago, and it's effectively slavery. You know, people working and, and picking cotton, harvesting cotton under the most atrocious conditions. So these are not just issues that you're, you know, and maybe you haven't thought about like this, but as you were talking, I'm saying like, well, this is still relevant today for an industry that still, you know, got people in effectively modern forms of slavery. Um, and it happens all over the world. Dude, I'm so, um, this is an amazing interview. I'm so happy you brought that up. Um, it is something I think about and learning more about, and I'd love for you to send me, you know, you know, you have my information, send me, some links and the stuff you've read. I'd really love to read it. Um, denim, so denim tears on the outside looks like it's talking about what black, the plight of black people and the black bullying is. That's what I'm talking about now, but really it's about the plight of the human condition. And so I create this stuff because I want people to do what you're doing and seeing how that would happen in the past ain't the past it's still happening you know what you said is happening now also there's prisoners down in, i forget where there's a prison where the the, the prisoners are like pick cotton that's their, their job and they get paid nothing just like you know when these fires are happening and these guys are getting paid like i don't know three dollars a week to fight the fires these inmates you know and there are people who are not inmates who are indentured slaves or just straight up slaves it's happening right now, you know, sex trafficking. There are women right now in LA that are trafficking into America, forced to sleep with men for money. They're, you know, they're, it's a whole different thing than the whole sex worker thing where, yes, we are for sex workers and be able to have all the rights and, you know, to operate their businesses safely. But there are women around the world, London, LA, New York, and around the Western world, women get trafficked, trafficked into these places and are forced. That's slavery. That is the same thing as someone picking cotton in a field in 1619. It's the same exact thing. And what you're talking about is the same thing. And that's what we we got to do. And you know, I'm I am not an activist, unfortunately. And you know, I don't dedicate my whole life to helping people, but I'm trying to do more every day. And um, you know, I. I do think, you know, um, spreading knowledge and getting involved with these things, you can make a difference. And um, yeah, man, no, I'm happy you brought that up. And that's a part of my whole thing is like this stuff's still happening. 
It ain't just about uh, what happened to black people in America. It's like, there's people of, subjugated people, people of color, 99% of the time, people of color around the world that are going through similar or the same things. And my main goal is to get people to care about the whole human condition because I care about what black people go through just as much as I care about what Armenians are going through. I might not have as much knowledge about it, but I care and I don't, and that's my main thing. If I could get anything across to the kids is don't, I can't tell people what to do. In my opinion, don't care about the plight of just your culture or people that look like you more than someone else's plight. Cause that's the real poison of humanity of nationalism and, you know, being so nationalistic that, well, I'm gonna look out for black people first. Or I'm gonna look out for Chinese people first. I'm gonna look out for Jewish people first. I'm gonna look out for Palestinian people first. I'm gonna look out where we all looking out for each other and caring about seeing that, okay, I went through this as a black person, but the Armenians are going through this and that counts too. And you know, these people went through this and they're going through this in India and using that as a way to connect, you know? It's like my grandma passed, Michael from Michael, my grandma passed. So if I want, I can go fully like, why me? Why'd she have to die? my grandma and be in my grief forever. Or I can be like, connect with other people who lost their grandmothers. And then it's not just about me, it's like seeing well, what this person go through, how they deal with it. And it's the same thing with, you know, the struggles we go through in this society, you know, as people. So that's a part of like the story I try to tell is like, you care about the human condition and care, you know. So I'm happy you brought that up. I wanna learn more about that. and. I'll definitely, yeah. I'll definitely send yeah. you some, I'll definitely send you some links. I've also written um, an op-ed for the New York Times on this topic, so I'll send that to you when it comes out uh, in December. Um, wow. So you know, I, I just want to say for the people watching now, if you have any questions for Tremaine, um, I'm happy to field those questions. You can put them in the in the chat um, below. Uh, but while we're waiting for any questions, Tremaine, I have one. I have one final question for you, which is: There's a lot of companies out there, like Nike, like Converse, like Levi's, you know, many, many, many others in our industry and beyond, that are looking to find authentic ways of working with Black creatives, um, supporting yeah. Black-owned businesses. You know what? If you're one of those, if you're sitting down with like the leaders in those companies, you know, what advice do you have to offer them about how they can create something genuinely authentic and impactful around these issues? That's not just marketing. Yeah, I would tell them, and I've been telling them, don't worry about finding the next Tremaine or Virgil or whoever, or Kirby or whoever. Worry about your executive boss from everywhere from the top tier, your C-suite, executive suite down to the guy in the stock room, are women, have, are women being treated equally? Are gay people, LGBT community being treated equally? And are people of color being treated equally? And do they have the chances? And if you're, you can't find people of color or women to do these jobs, figure out why. You're like, oh, we, we just can't find someone with the skills. Find out why, there are, why these people don't have the skills. Go into the communities that you make money off and figure out how these people can get educated and get mentored and get to the point that you can hire them for Levi's, Nike, Burberry, Givenchy, whatever. Forget doing the musical chairs. And I might sound like a hypocrite because I got a two year deal with Levi's, but forget doing the musical chairs of creatives and you know, find a woman creative, find a black creative, find an Indian creative. And then it's like, well, look, we're involved really get in the nitty gritty of the communities that support your brand. Really think about, hmm, why do people wear Michael Jordans? Because people in the hood, Spike Lee, you know, black people made this thing pop off. So on and so forth, we can go through coach, we made this thing pop off. How can we support that community? How can we help that community be more educated, be more healthy? so on and so forth. It ain't just about 
you know, creative director jobs. Because end of the day, I'm from uh, North Side, Jamaica, Queens. My story is a rare one. So me getting a Converse sneaker or a Levi sneaker, it don't change the, the plight or the fate of all my friends that are back there. Um, it takes more than that, just, you know, and, and these are the same people that trust me when they see the news of the Levi's deal, the Converse thing, they're celebrating, they're rooting for Tremaine, they feel proud, but it's not affecting their lives. It takes more to affect communities. And that's what I feel those, these brands should, should do. So worry less about pointing people as creative directors and really think, look at your, your hiring policies and then um, look at the communities that market your goods and you make money off. How can you help them? How can you serve them? Um, and making the bottom line humanity and not money because end of the day, if you make a, less, a few less billion, what does it matter? When most people live below, below the poverty line, you know? What does it matter? You know, and maybe I'm like living in a dream world. I don't think so. I don't think so. So that's my, that's my answer to that question is companies need to go deeper than anointing people. That's just, that, you know, that's just helping me and my immediate family. You want to help black community, African-American community. You want to help women at large. You want to help the LGBT community. You got to go deeper and help stop the systemic things that hurt those communities. Okay. We have a couple of questions that have come through. Normally we invite people to come on screen, but I'm not sure um, we we're going to have time. So I'll just, I'll read out some of these questions. We have a question cool. from, from Maddie Adlane. She says, what would you advise to the sustainable fashion movement in terms of storytelling? She says, I relate this question to the validation culture you mentioned before. Mm. What's the first part of the question again? What would you advise to the sustainable fashion movement in terms of storytelling? Mm. Um, I would... I would say to the sustainable fashion movement, do more than tell. So it's easier to become the next Patagonia or even take it further than they have as far as being sustainable and, and healthy for the world than trying to get work with said brand and get them to change. The best way to get the brand to change is by making it happen and them seeing that, oh, wow, this is profitable. And, you know, it's like be, Elon Musk is a good example in some ways. He wasn't trying to get Ford to change. He just created Tesla. Obviously, he had privilege, you know, the money he had, but he created Tesla. And that's showing the auto industry that it needs to change and it's possible. So that's my advice. Like show them through doing it, you know, which I know isn't easy, but that's my opinion. Okay. We have another question from Pedro Enrique Gomez, and he says, my question is, how do you see the gender topic in fashion, especially streetwear, where we have designs aimed at binary bodies? And how can we cross this barrier to make a more inclusive and innovative space in design? So, you know, not design, designing for um, non-binary, basically. Yeah. Great question. Um, I feel the best way for that to happen is through education and education where we're talking about these, these it's gender issues to kids because these kids are going to be the next people making fashion lines, sportswear, sportswear line, ready to wear, couture, whatnot and so forth. And it's just education, education people on these things, you know. Um, Mark Jacobs, his, uh, his new line, Heaven, it's non you know, it's non-binary, it's just clothing. The skirt is for everyone. And it's just called a skirt. It's not about women, you know, or men. So, um, and I think it's very important, you know, it's a part, it is in line with all these things we've been talking about for this last hour or so. And um, again, I believe it's education. And again, also showing through doing rather than, Nothing wrong with protesting and asking, you know, brands to do it. 
But when you do it and you do it well, that's what moves the that's what moves the um, yardstick. Uh, it looks like we have one one question asker who's ready to come on screen. So can we get David Boyo on screen? Cool. Hey, David. Hey, David, you're on mute, so we can't hear you. Yes, hi. How are you? Hi, do you remember me, Imran? <laughs> I have to say, I remember, I, I, I recognize you like vaguely as soon as yeah. your face popped up, but I'm not sure from where. Genius. A cool genius. Hopefully that you can remember that. <laughs> A cool genius. Oh, yes. How you doing? I'm not bad. Where are you today, David? Um, I'm at home. Just finished work. Um, work from home um, in London. So, yeah. How you doing, Tremaine? I don't know if you remember yeah. me as well, Tremaine. <laughs> I remember the name. Yeah, from mm. used, to, used to run a Nike basketball run in East London. I used to attend that oh, a few years holy ago. Holy moly. Now, you know what's funny? When I saw the name David Boyle, Boyle I saw it in like CC, like something <laughs> I was on CC, like yeah. on, a, on a email blast. I'm no, no lie. Email <laughs> blast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. you from the last four months. How you doing, man? Long time. Yeah, long time. Not bad, not bad. Um, Just to like save time. So basically my question has been something I've always, um, I've done research on and that's regulation within the fashion industry. What are the first, what are the first steps or any steps to take in terms of regulating the industry where we can eradicate things like racism, discrimination, um, fair labor, as well as um, uh, modern day slavery in parts of the world. For example, there's a question I asked um, Imran during the pandemic of how a lot of countries like Bangladesh were su suffering because a lot of fashion um, companies pulled out basically of manufacturing. So they were, so people were out of jobs. How do we yeah. reg reg regulate that so that doesn't, that doesn't happen again in the future? That's my question. Great question. Um, I feel like the consumer, it has, it's a dance between the mm. consumer and the producer. Right. So example is Rosa Parks, right? Yeah. She got off the back of the bus, went to the front of the bus, yeah. right? Then everyone boycotted. They boycotted for, a, I think, over a year. Mm. And that changed things there. Yeah. So we can't expect, it's unfortunate, we can't expect H&M or Zara or whoever but if we boycott them, they will change. Because that's the thing. These people, the only, only thing they care about is money. But then we got to care about what the people are going through in Bangladesh. The consumer has mm -hmm. to care about the thing they're buying. Me included. I'm not speaking from the ivory tower. Yeah. We got to care about the things they're buying and then hold companies accountable. The companies are so... The thing about it is that the people who are only motivated by money, they're easy to control. Yeah. Just stop them. Just control their money. Yeah. Someone who's controlled by moral aptitude, that's a harder person to manipulate and control. Yeah. We actually, as consumers, have a lot of power. We just don't realize it. Mm, that's true. Okay. Right. Okay. Makes Thank sense. you so much, David. Thank you very much. Have a nice good evening. to see David. you again. Thanks for, you too, thanks for watching so many BOF Lives. <laughs> Definitely. Um, uh, we're out of time, Tremaine. That was that was really amazing conversation to have with you. Um, I don't think we've ever had a chat, chance to talk that long, but um, real pleasure. No. Real pleasure to hear your your story and your perspectives on what's happening in the world. Um, congrats on the collaborations and the partnerships. I look forward to seeing more of your storytelling and narratives um, intersect with our industry. So um, thank you so much. Thanks for making time to talk to me, Imran. I appreciate it. No problem. And thanks to all of you for joining. I'm Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. Uh, if you are interested in more, BOF events, please check out events. Uh, actually, check out businessoffashion.com slash events and stay tuned. December 1st to 3rd, we do our big annual flagship event voices, which this year is going to be really different because we're not going to be doing it as a physical event, but we have lots of cool speakers, topics, and ideas that we're going to share, including Virgil, who's going to join us 
um, or um, a session uh, in our technology and innovation session. So you can sign up for voices um, via BOF. Thanks again, Tremaine, and see you all later.